If I were to ask you how you are doing and gave you some time to think about this, what would be your response? You know, I think one of the, as I was thinking about that question, I was thinking about, you know, really, I'm sure most of our responses would be based on how much darkness or the lack thereof is in our mind. Right? I mean, when we talk about, hey, how are you doing? We often respond in light of, you know, the hardships and difficulties and situations in life that come upon us. Darkness has a true heaviness and weight in our lives. There are a lot of ways in which there can be darkness, uh, darkness like this. Sometimes darkness is a mean word, attack. Sometimes darkness is a difficult situation, a heaviness that just, you know, you, you feel powerless to, to address. You see the direction our country is and how can I even change the darkness in our land? Sometimes darkness involves sin. You, you think of the issue that you've been struggling with day in, day out. God, how could you ever forgive me? Sometimes the darkness is unanswered prayer. Or direction. God, I've been praying and I've been seeking your direction and yet I'm not hearing anything. And then sometimes that darkness is made worse by the fact that God seems to wait far longer than we would like. And there's the darkness. Is, is God ever going to do something? Is he ever going to show up? Is he ever going to change it? So when I ask the question, how are you doing? We often define ourselves in light of darkness. How much darkness is in our life? How long has it been going in the place? To go through this sermon, I would encourage you to be thinking <laughs> of those dark elements in your life. Things that are not going right for one way, shape, or form. And I kind of want us to see just how real and how impacting light and darkness is. So what I'm going to do in a second is I'm going to ask the guys up in the booth to turn off the lights. We're going to make sure all the doors are shut. And we're just going to sit quietly in darkness and try to make sure your electronic devices don't turn on. Alright? And then after some time has passed, they're going to turn back the, lock, the, the, turn back the lights on. Now, if you do not like darkness, and sitting in darkness, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to step out right now. That's going to scare you. That's not what I'm trying to do. But I want us to experience darkness. And see how it affects you, and then see how it affects you when the lights are turned back on. Okay, if anyone want to leave? Give me a hand. I'm not going to make your sister leave or anything like that. I get it. We all have our, our things we're carrying. All right? Go ahead and kill the lights. We don't know when we're going to know, where we have to wait. 
when you think about it, <laughs> wickedness, waiting, darkness. We're working through the names of some of the names of Jesus Christ. And if you've ever encountered darkness in your life, these names regarding Jesus speak into that darkness. We're going to be looking at three, kind of four names. We're going to be starting in Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. So if you have your Bible, open them to Numbers 24, 17. And then we're going to jump to Malachi, the last book of the Old Testament, the last chapter of the last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4, verse 2. And then we're going to end with Revelation 22, verse 16. So we're going to be looking at three passages. Kind of four, we're going to briefly look at Luke chapter 1, verse 78, which we read earlier as well, because it connects with um, Revelation, or not Revelation, but Malachi chapter 4, verse 22. But all of these, this is what we're going to be talking about, relate to names of Christ that are related to either the star or the sun. To a star or sun. Light that penetrates darkness. And based on my study this past week on these four different names, this is how I would kind of describe what Christ, what God is trying to reveal about who Jesus is as it relates to the star out of Jacob, the sun of righteousness, the sunrise or the morning star. They all reveal Jesus as holy, heavenly human ruler who brings hope to his people that his whole victory is coming. That Jesus is holy, He's a heavenly human who rules and brings hope to his people that his whole victory is coming. One of the reasons why I wanted to kind of kill the lights, and there was still a fair amount of ambient light, right? But can you imagine most of human history has not experienced electricity? They've not experienced watches that you wear. They had no sense, or it was difficult for them to understand how long the darkness would last, literally overnight. It is into that world that God wants to say, hey, I want to reveal something about my son who I'm sending, because you need to know that we live in that kind of a dark world, that there is a light by which you can measure and find so, on a dark night, you can see beautiful stars. Have anyone been to one of like those, what do they call it, the night sky or dark sky? <laughs> you know, where there's no ambient light and have been able to look up at the heavens and it's not cloudy you can see the stars? I mean, it's just absolutely stunning, isn't it? I mean, they're absolutely beautiful. But in the ancient world, how did they know how long the, the, the night would last? Well, I got a little bit of a clue from that when I was growing up as a kid. My grandfather learned how to tell time on the stars. And I remember growing up, and I don't think he was, you know, like making himself out a little better than he really was. So I feel like a, a sneak peek of a watch. But I remember we were out sitting outside and, and looking up into the night sky, and it would seem like we were there out talking, and it was getting late, and I wonder what time it was. And my grandpa said, you know what, I can tell the time by the stars. And I'm like, no, really? Did you do that? He's like, yeah. And so he, I think it was like 10, 12 or something, but he guessed. It was actually 10, 14 now. How did you do that? Well, it's based on the fact of where the Big Dipper is in relationship to the night sky. He could tell based on where the Big Dipper was, that was probably around 10, 15. Because, I don't know about you, I've never really observed it this close, but the stars actually rotate in the sky. They move in the sky. I knew that that was true, but I haven't seen it. Thankfully, YouTube is around, and instead of having to wait a couple of hours to actually see it happen, uh, here is the Big Dipper, which is going to start in this lower corner and work this way, uh, going in this night nice sky. Take a look at this and how it moves. So there it is. Move in this direction. And you can tell how what time it is as the stars move and rotate. Right? 
That's the concept. That's what's going on here. And it is because of some of those pieces that it, the stars began to be valued in, in kind of some cultures even worshipped. Right? Here are the four names that we're going to be looking at. Um, Star out of Jacob is the first one. The second one is Son of Righteousness. Sunrise is the Greek, and then we're going to end with the Morning Star, where Jesus calls himself the Morning Star. And that's kind of the, the context. In the ancient world, they did develop astronomy, or the study of the stars. Primarily, that occurred in Babylon. And Babylon was kind of known as the astronomers of the ancient world since at least before 3000 BC, before Abraham even was born, maybe a thousand years before Abraham was born, they studied the stars, they tried to understand what the stars and the sun and the moon, and we actually see a little bit of that revelation even in uh, the New Testament. Take a look at Paul's comments about it, 1 Corinthians 1541, that there are different kinds of glory, different kinds of impressiveness in terms of the heavenly lights. There's the glory of the sun, then there's the, another glory of the moon, and then there's another glory of the stars, and even among the stars, the stars there were in glory, the different in brightness. And so there was this sense of awe and amazement of the power of the light that each of these would produce in relationship to the darkness, that there was an increasing awe. One of the kind of key themes that you see in the scriptures, even in the ancient world, is just the number of stars that there were, how bright they are often in the darkness of the sky, and then they would move across the sky. Those things began to kind of build, and Babylon wasn't just interested, though, in, in just understanding the star system. They were trying to understand, hey, how does this apply to our lives? And so they were the ones who really developed a lot of the astrology, where they assigned and believed that, you know, the stars are really deity, and so what the deity do is they move around, they're going to indicate what they're doing in this world, and so if I can read them right, I can make my life better. In fact, it was around 400 BC, 400 years before Christ, that they developed, ultimately, the zodiac. The zodiac, to help give guidance and direction to people, and that is one of the reasons why the scriptures and it hammers time and time and time again. Do not worship the stars. Don't look to the stars to lead your life. God is the one who's in charge of the stars. The heavens do declare and they will give signs about what God's going to do, but ultimately our trust is not in the sun or the moon or the stars. It's in God alone. That's the kind of context of which the Word of God came. So we're going to now look at the Numbers chapter 24, verse 17. But I've got to set the context here. And the best way to set the context is this map. The Israelites have just finished their 40 years of wandering. They're about to enter the Promised Land. And uh, as they were traveling around Moab, they kind of came into this area and they did a couple of battles against some Amorite kings. These were some native people who did believe in God. God was putting them under judgment. They defeat them. And the king of Moab starts to get nervous because they defeated the people who ruled this area. And so the Israelites could be powerful if they could come down and attack his kingdom. And so what he decided to do is he decided to hire a prophet. He decided to hire a mercenary prophet named Baal. So King Balak of Moab hires Balaam, who comes down from upper areas of Syria, comes all the way down, meets with them, and then says, you know what, I want you to curse the Israelites. And in their day, cursing was kind of like our day of canceling, right? We want you to call the gods down and just judge Israel, because we don't want them to be attacking Moab. And Balaam was not a, a respectable person by any means, you know what I mean? Especially someone who says, we'll, we'll curse with they, you know what I mean? If they don't curse they want to But at one level, he did say and did recognize, you know what? I can only say what God allows me to say. And this is the fourth oracle that he was supposed to do judgment on Israel. And instead, God takes a hold of his life and he ends up giving blessing instead. Judgment. Now look at what 
is said in this fourth occurrence. Numbers chapter 24, verse 15. And so he took up his discourse and said, This is the oracle of Baal, the son of Beor, the oracle of the man whose eyes have been opened. God revealed to him some truth. Despite his pagan, his unbelieving behavior, God revealed to him truth. Let me see what he ends up saying. The oracle to him, who hears the words of God, who knows the knowledge of the Most High, he sees the vision of the Almighty falling down with his eyes uncovered, and we get to verse 17. I see him, but not now. Behold, he is not near. A star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. It shall crush the forehead of Moab and break down all the sons of Shem. So here we see the focus on the star. A star shall come out of heaven. One of the key or out of Jacob. One of the key things to notice is the star here is often pictures kings in the ancient near world because they kind of saw that you know the stars of the levels of brightness and greatness, just like kings in our day. That's still true. One of the emblems of Israel is the star of David. It comes from this passage. Of course, we do the same thing, right? We're no different, really. We just put our stars in concrete because the great people who do our movies and music, we want to get recognition. It's that same kind of concept that we're talking about. The star shall come out of Jacob, a scepter shall rise out of Israel. The fact that he uses a star means that it's heavenly, and that would make sense in their day because they often thought things were divine, they thought they were gods. Israel probably would have understood this more of just that he's going to have a lot of power, but what was really these that God was really revealing the truth that Jesus was going to be God. And yet he was going to come out of Jacob, a king who was going to rise out of Israel. He was both the God and he was man. Brought the two together. He was going to have power that would be stunning and glorious and wonderful. But notice what he introduced in the very first part of the verse. I see him, but he's not now. He doesn't come on the scene at this point. This is around 1400 BC. It was going to be for another 1,400 years. So he's saying, I'm looking far into the future and behold him, but he is not near. It's going to be at some time before Christ is going to come. And here we see one of the earliest prophecies of the Christ, and it's coming from a pagan mercenary prophet. But this king, what he will do is crush the forehead of Moab. He will break down all the sons of Moab. The people who are going to destroy, who wanted to destroy Israel, who wanted to destroy God's people, who wanted to curse God's people. If you've ever been criticized, if you've ever been attacked for your faith, you know what Israel was feeling like. What he said is that this coming king someday will defeat everyone who opposes and attacks God's people. Some of them, David did partially fulfill this, but not entirely because Moab that survived. And what Baal is seeing into the future is Christ's ultimate victory over every evil person forever. That this actually troubled some of the Jewish rabbis later who studied this passage because Balaam was not a good guy. And uh, one of the uh, rabbis said this, and if you know the rest of the story, you'll appreciate this. How can Balaam know the knowledge of the Most High that he cannot even understand the mind of his ex? That's what he said. Just because of the revelation God has given Balaam about Jesus Christ. That in the midst of the darkness of being cursed and attacked, God instead showed up and gave a small light of blessing upon Israel. And that was to indicate to the Israelites that someday they would have a king who would not just be their king, but who would defeat every enemy of the one person. Star that has come out of you. Now look at Malachi. Malachi chapter 4. 
beginning with verse 1. Again, we're going to see the context of this name of Christ comes the end times. For behold, the day is coming, burning like an oven, when the arrogant and evildoers will be stubble. The day that is coming shall set them ablaze as the Lord hosts, so that it will leave them with neither root nor branch. They will be entirely consumed. God will fully judge his people. And when will that day happen? Look at Malachi. But for you who fear my name, the sun of righteousness shall rise with healing in its wings. You shall go out, leaping like calves in the stall. But for you who fear my name, for those people who revere and honor God, I think it's so encouraging that Malachi did say, and for you people who do everything right and never sin. Did he say that? No. He said, you fear my name. You give me honor, you give me glory. Then the son of righteousness will come. In my uh, class today, we were, Sunday school class, we were, we were talking about science, the Bible, the text. Many people have the science of the Bible. One of the things that I told them is uh, in the sermon today, I, I have seen how even though the Bible is not a scientific book, the more we understand science, the more we can appreciate what God has actually done. And this is a particular thing that's kind of special to me, is here Jesus is called the Son of Righteousness. What the ancient world did not know at that point is the sun is yet another star. Except what? It's the closest star to us. The star of, that will come out of Jacob will come so close that he is the source of righteousness. It's not our righteousness that saves us. It's the fact that we absorb his righteousness because we fear the name. It's not because that I am perfect. It's because he is perfect. And I say, Jesus, my life belongs to you. He is the source of life. He is the source of righteousness. And as a result, he brings healing. Again, another wonderful illustration. This is before they realize that when you stand out in the sun, you get a necessary vitamin, right? The vitamin D. You feel much better. The nth degree is going to happen when Christ comes back with healing in his wings. Now, why would they call healing in his wings in reference to the sun? Well, there's actually a, a common motif. In fact, this is the seal. Um, of the ancient uh, king Hezekiah, and you can see here the sun with wings <coughs> coming out, and they're kind of like four rays, and so they kind of focus that. And as I started looking, they were actually getting this from the Persians. The Persians became I love this picture, and so here you actually have another. This is a Persian picture of you've got the sun in the center, and you've got wings coming out. And I went and looked at this. Next picture, look at how it compares to the sun wings. Or the wings. The rays that just kind of picture the helium's wings, those rays that, that warm it. I mean, my dog loves the sun. I mean, he loves going outside laying the sun. In fact, the other day it was looking outside for us, it almost looks like he's dead. I mean, he was just like, oh, I am soaking it all in. This is written. When the Persians were in control, Malachi chapter four verse two. Back here, Malachi four verse two. This was written when the Persians were in control. And what God wanted them to know, when He wanted His people to know, that at some point He was going to send the promise, the Son of Righteousness, the Source of who does it all right. And when He starts to show up, it's going to be like the sun rising over the horizon, and you experience His world. You rejoice that you have survived the night in the darkness because its rays are going to hit you and it's going to heal all the darkness that is a part of your life. That's why, fast forward 400 years of God's silence between the two testaments, and we hear what was read earlier in the day where Zechariah says, Because of the tender mercies of God, whereby the sun rises, Salvation that is from my most powerful leaders, 
He's pulling this from Malachi chapter 4. To give light to those who sit in darkness. And a shadow of death. He heals us from death. He gives us guidance to our feet. And he leads us in peace. All the kinds of healing that God has poured out upon his people. And of course, when Christ did come, um, that's what he starts to do. Remember the day when he first realized the truth and the beauty of the gospel and said, I need that. Or as you grew up and you realized, you know what? I have that kind of Savior who wants to restore my life and someday give me a perfect life. In his presence. What a glorious day that will be when Christ finishes the work he has started. Back, going back to uh, Malachi 4 2, he actually described what it's going to look like. You shall go out leaping like calves from the stone. I didn't grow up on a farm, I grew up in the city. So for me, anytime I get any kind of agricultural thing, you know where I like to go to the concrete, that you do. Right? You want to see what we are looking like as Christians when Christ comes back, when the sun finally rises, when he's no longer a, a bright star at night, but instead he's established his kingdom and he's wiped out all darkness. This is what we're going to be like. Oh, here we go. Cool. So, uh, we're going to start that in our animals. These are young cats, some of them born over the winter. So, never seen them. They're going to know what we can say. Well, they're not going to be going around, so it's a bit of a shock for them. Here we are. I don't know. Sounds like a weird. Oh, no, that's not a problem here. Look at them go around. Look at It's brilliant, isn't it? Good excitement here. They're not here, right? Look at that. I know red sources. I think we're going to let the cows out tomorrow. And if you look out there, you can just see the cows looking over the fence. They're obviously upset not to be let out. We go back and it, uh, one of the reasons uh, why I was like, Malachi, or to the sun of righteousness, rising and healing in its wings. We sing about it. We are the Christmas and heart the old angels. <laughs> Charles Wesley writes, Hail the heaven born Prince of Peace. Hail the S U N of righteousness. Now, you'll see a lot of people will sometimes think that that's a typo, and so they'll change it to an S O N. But it really is S U N, son of righteousness. Light and light to all he brings, he's risen. Risen from the dead with healing. That's where our lives are headed. That's where our lives are. Now look at Revelation 22. Again, the setting, the end of the world, the end of judgment. We're outside. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to eat the tree of life. That they may enter the city, but this is the city of the New Jerusalem. This is heaven, this is where God is the one of his people. Blessed are those who have their robes washed because they put their faith and trust in Christ. Verse 13 Outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves to practice falsehood. End time judgment. Notice what Jesus then says in verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify and not to you about these things in the churches. The book of Revelation was given by Jesus to John for us. Jesus, I, I want you to understand, when you read the Revelation, you see a lot of darkness, right? It's the darkest of the dark times in Revelation. And here we come, and Jesus gives us one last name, of which the Bible is filled with many of the names, and it's the last name that's is trying to remind us, in light of the darkness that's coming, who he is. I am the root and descendant of David. Remember that a couple of weeks ago, but I am the bright morning star. 
He's the bright morning star. We know very clearly because of what he says here that everyone in his day, the age of John, would have known this is the star Venus that often rises in the morning. This is one of those wonderful examples where science then ended up helping us realize the brightest star that is a star or a, a, a planet is Venus. And it is both in the morning and in the evening. It's kind of like the beginning and the end, the Alpha and the Omega. But Jesus is emphasizing the bright morning star. Here is a picture of that bright morning star. That is not the moon right there. That is Venus. It's also the closest planet to the Earth. So this picture where the presence of Christ is close to his people in times of darkness such that he shines brilliantly. Here's what it actually looks like if you were to get up close to it. It's almost white. It looks like a, a mirror to the gas and stuff. So between being the closest planet and having that white kind of cover, it really shines brightly in the night sky. I, Jesus, from the root and the descent of David, the bright morning star. Why would he say that? One of the things I've learned about the planet Venus is whenever you see it in the morning sky, you know the sun is coming. At the most, it appears about four hours before the sun comes. What Jesus is saying is my presence in your life is intended to cast out the darkness, but the fullness of my presence is coming. Someday you will experience it nothing but light. When we're in heaven and we ask, hey, how are you doing? Jesus is shining. Amen. The other interesting thing about the bright morning star, Venus, the Babylonians called it Ishtar. And for them, it was the greatest power in the world. And if you've read Revelation, you know Babylon shows up a lot. <laughs> what Jesus is basically saying is the best that this world can offer is a sham. But I'm the one. I am the one I saw. I came once, and sometime I'm coming again. And when I do, that morning star becomes close, such that we won't even need a sun. Right? Because God is closest with his people, and the light is brilliant. So, why is it important that we know Jesus is the star out of Jacob, who is the son of righteousness, that is the sun that is rising, or that he is the morning sun? When we see that, when we keep our eyes focused on that, this is the truth. Gaze on the star of our faith to raise your hand. Gaze on the star of our faith to raise your hand. You see, what Jesus is saying, what scriptures are saying, is in this world you will have trouble. There will be darkness. And yet you will be able to see a point of light where you're reminded. That Christ has given victory in that area, and yet someday it's going to be world. It's going to cover everything. You know the darkness in your life that you thought about when we talked about when we started the sermon? What Jesus is saying, I am shining now, and I want you to know that I'm going to come and someday I'm going to wipe that. You see, Jesus is the morning star now because someday he's going to be the sun of us. And that's when we're so good. And yet, what we need to do is not be in the darkness. Did you notice when you were sitting here? I know it's true of me. I started looking at all the lights, right? If you notice the lights in the darkness, because you know, as Christians, we often do the opposite. We focus in on all the things that are wrong, and we forget the one who has come. And we'll set it all for See, the problem is we're not the best of starters. 
in the sense of the star of faith, the one is Jesus Christ. So in those times of darkness, we've got to gaze, focus in on who Christ is. And then we pray. And boy, let me tell you, that is not easy. There have been times in my life, multiple times, where all I can basically say is, Jesus, I don't know what you're doing, but I am simply holding this tight to I love you. I believe you are my morning star who someday will arise and bring the full healing that my heart in this world needs. What we need to do as Christians is to realize that whenever we feel powerless, whenever we feel beat down by our sin, whenever we feel guilt, whenever we feel despondent over death, Whenever life is going bad, whenever we're criticized or harassed or whatever, you know what? I have a Lord who loves me in my focus. How do we do that this week? I'll give you just a simple, practical example that you can start with this evening. Take one of these three passages. You want to do Luke? That's fine too. It's four. Pick one of these three passages. They're in your bulletin. I'll find it. Just pick one. And what I'd like you to do, one of the last things you do before you go to bed, and one of the first things you do when you rise. Read that verse and picture how Jesus has produced one victory in your life. Maybe it's the time you came to save Maybe it's the time he. He provided miraculously, or, or at least it blew your minds when all of a sudden some money showed up that you needed. You see, all of those little events demonstrate that Christ someday is going to express those little events worldwide in our lives. We do not need to be held hostage by the darkness that this world has. Or, I should say, we will be held hostage. We're not looking to Christ as a morning star. The one who is the king, who has power and is coming again. His presence that he came once means his coming is near, just like Venus is. So, what I would like you to do morning and evening, read one of these verses, take about five minutes, think of one thing where you've seen God demonstrate the victory in your life and then pray and say this to the Lord. Lord, you did that. Christ is my son and my son of righteousness morning star. I will set my goal. Alright? Let me close with this final time lapse picture. It's a time lapse of the entire night. Started just after sunset. <coughs> You'll see that stars swell our place. But the reason why I chose this one is look how morning walks when it finally comes. For friends, that is our destiny. Because Christ is shining in our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us his name for Jesus. Star out of Jacob, the sun of righteousness, the sun of us, the morning, the bright of the morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for being the light in a very dark world. Whatever darkness is in our lives, Father, I pray our focus would be on Jesus. 
Jesus Christ. I pray that you would help us to remember the time in which we have seen a glimpse of the glory that is coming. A glimpse of what you are going to do when you blow our minds away. In Christ comes. Father, whatever darkness is in our life right now, I pray that our focus, our faith, our gaze will be on the fact that Christ is present in us. And that someday, someday, he shows that. Morning. Darkness will go. We will be in Christ for all of eternity without ever fearing. Thank you, Father, for the hope we have in Christ. Thank you for the demonstrations, the small demonstrations of your provision in our lives right now. And may we trust your word as we look forward to the day when Christ will come and warn us. For it's in the name of Jesus, the star and the sun of our faith. It's in his name we pray.